بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كتاب الأيمان أيمان is the plural of يمين which means an oath that you take so what is an oath? it is to emphasize a matter that you are saying by making mention of something that is venerated in a specific way there are three letters in the Arabic language of an oath the wow, the ba and the ta it is haram to take an oath by anyone other than Allah Jalla wa ala, and you're allowed to use any of his names or attributes or characteristics to take an oath. So the Prophet would often say, وَالَّذِي nafsi بِيَدِهِ By the one who has my soul in his hand. If you take an oath and you are lying intentionally, that is to say you're not merely mistaken, so if you have taken an oath to make somebody believe you, and you are lying and you know you are lying, then this is a sinful act. But is it a yamin al the type of yamin or oath which sinks you into sin? Because that is what ghamus is, when you sink in. And the hadith says in the sahih, مَنْ حَلَفَ عَلَى يَمِينٍ لِيَقْتَطِعَ بِهَا مَا لِمْرِئٍ مُسْلِمٍ لَقِيَ اللَّهَ وَهُوَ عَلَيْهِ غَبَّانٍ Whoever takes an oath, just in order to take some wealth of a Muslim person away, so unjustly, then this person would meet Allah whilst Allah is angry with him. This is Yameen al ghamus And this type of Yameen is specific to if you take an oath to take somebody's wealth away from him. And it is not for every lying oath. Sure, a lying oath is sinful, but an oath in which you lie in order to take away somebody's wealth is yet worse. If a person takes an oath by other than Allah Jalla wa ala, then this oath is invalid, meaning his presence is like its absence. And he is also sinful. Because taking an oath by other than Allah Jalla wa ala is minor shirk. Because you are putting somebody else on the same level as Allah Jalla wa ala. Remember you take an oath by someone venerated. And no one deserves that level except Allah Jalla wa ala. Also it is permissible to take an oath by what appears to be predominant in your mind. And if the reality is other than what he took an oath for, then he is not sinful. So for example, if a person says, Wallahi, Amr is going to arrive tomorrow from his holiday. And he's saying this because Amr told him that he will arrive tomorrow. So he is quite sure in his mind that Amr will arrive tomorrow. So he says, Wallahi, Amr will arrive tomorrow from his holiday. Now if Amr does not arrive tomorrow, because maybe his plane is delayed or some other problems, then is such a person sinful for taking this oath? The answer is no, because if you take an oath based on what is predominant in your thoughts, then you're allowed to do so, and if the reality turns out to be otherwise, then you are not sinful. And the reason why there is no sin upon him is because in himself he is truthful. He is not trying to deceive anyone, and it is not the case that he knows he is lying. And the textual evidence for this is the famous hadith, about the man who had conjugal relations with his wife during the daytime of Ramadan, he said, There is no family between the two mountains of Al Madina poorer than mine. This is taking an oath based on what is predominant in your thoughts. Let's take the first chapter and the first hadith about this idea that it is forbidden to take an oath by other than Allah. Jalla wa ala. The Prophet saw Umar radiallahu an, who was taking an oath by his father. So he's saying, by my father. So the Prophet called out to the people saying, Ala inna Allah Azza wa Jalla yanhaakum an tahlifu bi abaikum faman gana halifan fal yahlif billahi aw liyasmut. Behold, Allah Azza wa Jal has forbidden you to take an oath by your fathers. So whoever is going to take an oath, then let him take an oath by Allah or keep quiet. Taking an oath by your fathers was something common in the days of Jahiliyyah. So you find this habit is still with some of the companions. The Prophet enjoins the good and forbids the evil here. And that's a lesson for us to speak out when we see or hear something that will not please Allah Jalla wa ala. The Prophet says that Allah has forbidden it. But we do not find in the Quran that Allah forbids taking an oath by other than Allah. However, it does not have to be in the Qur'an. Allah Jalla wa ala can reveal ahkam to the Prophet through other than the Qur'an, through the ahadith, which is what we find in this case. The word aba, or fathers, is used. 
but it could be mothers and brothers and sisters and so on. And to take an oath by your fathers or anyone else is minor shirk because this type of status, taking an oath by someone venerated, is only suitable for Allah Jalla wa'ala. It could be shirk asghar if this person takes an oath by his father, but he venerates the father in his heart less than Allah. Or it could be shirk akbar if he venerates the father in his heart equal to Allah or more so than Allah Jalla wa'ala. However, in Sahih Muslim, we do find the hadith about the man who came to ask the Prophet about Islam. And the Prophet والسلام, told him about the Salah, about the Zakah, about the Siyam. And the man went away saying, I will not increase nor decrease on this. And the Prophet said, Qad aflaha wa abihi in, sadaq. in one of the narrations, these are the words used. By his father, he will succeed if he is speaking the truth. So the Prophet says, wa abihi by his father, meaning by that man's father, he will succeed if he is telling the truth. We can say that maybe the most reasonable explanation to this is that this is from the oaths which run on the tongue without the meaning being intended because the Arab were fond of taking oaths by their fathers and so this is the type of habit they had. So we can say that even if it is established that the Prophet did say that, we can explain it by saying that the Prophet said it without intending the meaning because it's one of those words that run off the tongue without really intending the meaning. Let's take a look at this next chapter. The one who takes an oath by Allah or al uzza needs to say La ilaha illallah. From Abu Huraira, the Prophet said, Man halafa minkum faqala fi halifihi billat falyaqul la ilaha illallah. Wa man qala li sahibihi ta'ala uqamirka falyatasaddaq. Whoever takes an oath and he says in his oath, by a lat, then as an expiation he must say la ilaha illallah and whoever says to his friend come i'll gamble with you then as an expiation he must give charity a lat is one of the idols of the quraysh it is also mentioned in the quran and the quraysh would take an oath by a lat and the remedy of shirk is tawheed it's the complete opposite of course and we have the same ruling with gambling Gambling is exploiting others, gaining at their expense, and charity is the complete opposite, giving others, not wanting anything in return. So we find in both points made in the hadith, you treat the problem with its opposite. What is apparent is that this order is by way of obligation. Okay, here's an interesting question. We said that you're allowed to take an oath by the descriptions of Allah, something that describes Allah Jalla wa'ala. Now that includes the speech of Allah. So you could say, well, Quran, by the Quran, because the Quran is a speech of Allah. But what about his sifa khabariya, the types of attributes which, if applied to us, would form body parts? Well, could you say, well, by the face of Allah? The face can be used to denote Allah Jalla wa'ala. وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ The face of your Rabb will remain. That does not mean just the face will remain and Allah, the rest of him will not remain. The face is a sifa khabariya and it is used to denote Allah Jalla wa'ala, his essence. But the same cannot be said about the hand or the foot of Allah. Even though the hand and the foot of Allah Jalla wa'ala are sifa khabariya and we absolutely affirm them in the literal sense, however they are suited to Allah Jalla wa'ala, meaning uniquely suited to him. But we do not take an oath by them because with these attributes, they do not denote Allah Jalla wa'ala themselves. And here we are talking about the Sifa Khabariya. Again, the Sifa Khabariya are those attributes which, if applied to us, would form body parts. But of course, we cannot say they form body parts to Allah Jalla wa'ala. That does not apply. Okay, here's another question. How much charity should you give if you fall into this mistake? The Hadith does not say. So any charity would be good charity. And the more, the merrier. Although you can argue that if the type of gambling you're calling your friend to is a big gambling, then you give a bigger sadaqah. If it is a smaller type of gambling, then you give a smaller sadaqah. This would make sense. Let's take a look at the next chapter. It is better to break the oath if you find something better than the oath you have taken. There are many ahadith in this chapter. We'll go for the one on the authority of Abdurrahman ibn Samura. He reports that the Prophet said to me, Ya Abdurrahman ibn Samura, La tas'al al-imara. فَإِنَّكَ إِنْ أُعْطِيتَهَا عَنْ مَسْأَلَةٍ وَقِلْتَ إِلَيْهَا وَإِنْ أُعْطِيتَهَا عَنْ غَيْرِ مَسْأَلَةٍ 
وعنت عليها وإذا حلفت على يمين فرأيت غيرها خيرا منها فكفر عن يمينك وقت الذي هو خير أو عبد الرحمن بن سمرة Do not ask for positions of authority For if you are given it because you ask for it you will be left to it But if you are given it without having asked for it you will be aided in it And if you take an oath to do something but then thereafter you see something better then offer the kafara for your oath and do that which is better there is also another narration narrated with many roots in this chapter the gist of it is that abu musa al-ash'ari came with his tribe to the prophet requesting the prophet to give them riding animals the prophet took an oath by allah that he cannot provide them with a mount so they stayed with him a while then thereafter some camels were brought to the Prophet and the Prophet ordered that three white humped camels be given to them. They informed the Prophet that, O oh Prophet, you took an oath that you will not give us camels and now you are giving us camels. To which the Prophet said, I did not provide you with the camels, Allah provided you. And he says, by Allah, if Allah wills, I will not take an oath on anything and then I see something which is better than it, except that I would offer the expiation for my oath and I would do that which is better. First of all, on the narration of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, a few interesting points can be picked up. That if you cannot give somebody something, then justify to them why not. As the Prophet told them that I do not have any camels to give you. And also, because this will soothe any grudge or ill feeling they may have towards you. Also interesting is that when the Prophet gave them these camels, the companions there, the Ash'ariyun, they were saying that Allah will not bless us in these camels. Why? Because we asked the Prophet and he was not able to give us and then he gave us which means that he undertook much difficulty to try to find camels to give us and so we have put the Prophet into difficulty so how can we be blessed then with these camels? And this is true, you should not accept a gift from somebody who is giving it out of embarrassment because he is not giving it to you out of his own free good will. The Prophet told them that Allah Jalla gave it to you, not I. Because these camels came to the Prophet without any effort on the Prophet's part. So it is to be attributed to Allah Jalla wa'ala. And we take the main fa'idah, is that if you take an oath and you see something better, then give an expiation of your oath and do that which is better. The same can be said with a waqf as well. And a nadr, moving to something that which is better and more beneficial is worthy to be done. As we found in the hadith of the man, who took a vow to pray in the Masjid al-Aqsa if Allah grants them the conquest of Mecca the Prophet told him pray in the Masjid al-Haram so you can pray in a Masjid that is more virtuous than the Masjid al-Aqsa so we can say about the Nadr that you can change it to that which is better likewise with the Waqf as well if somebody gives a book as a Waqf to be given in a Masjid let's say but nobody's reading it and in another Masjid there'll be more readers put it in the other Masjid other than the one appointed by the person giving the waqf. So do that which is better, do that which is more beneficial. And we also learn from both of the narrations we have quoted that you make the kafara first and then you do that which is better. However, because the letter wow is used, which means and, it does not necessarily denote tartib or an order. So you could do it the other way around as well. If you break your oath, then it is called a kafara. But if you offer the kafara before breaking the oath, then this kafara is called technically a tahilla, as in Allah Jalla wa'ala saying in Surah Al-Tahreem, قَدْ فَرَضَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ تَحِلَّةَ أَيْمَانِكُمْ So this tahilla is when you offer the kafara before you actually break the oath. We also learn that breaking the oath is a great matter because even if you're going to do that which is better, you still have to offer the kafara. As Allah Jalla wa'ala says, وَحْفَظُوا أَيْمَانَكُمْ Safeguard your oaths. And one of the tafsir here, is to offer the kafara for your oaths if you have broken your oath. Now, there is something a little weird in this hadith. The Prophet says to the Ash'ariyeen, Wallahi la ahmilukum, Wallahi I will not give you a ride. Does this seem out of character? A Prophet taking an oath that he will not give them a ride? We do not know from the normal practice of the Prophet that he would say such a thing. So it does seem to be out of character. Why is this? It may be that the Prophet is angry at this particular stage and so he spoke these words which are slightly harsh for his standards when somebody asks him for something 
And no matter how good a character you have, if you're angry, you will not be the same as when you're not angry. And so sometimes you could meet a person who is gentle and mild-natured with a great character, but one day he speaks to you in a slightly rough fashion, something which is out of character for him. So you do need to entertain the possibility that maybe there are some external factors making him say or behave the way he is doing, which you are unaware of. So do take that into account. And if somebody does treat you or speak to you in a rough manner, remember the words of Allah Jalla wa'ala, خُذِ الْعَفْوَ وَأْمُرْ بِالْعُرْفِ وَأَعْرِضْ عَنِ الْجَاهِلِينَ Forgive or overlook the people and enjoy the good and turn away from the ignorant ones. We have a narration in Sahih al-Bukhari which gives us a good example of this ayah in Surah Al-A'raf whereby a man called Uyina said to Umar ibn al-Khattab when he was the Khalifa, you do not give us much wealth and you do not judge between us with justice. To which Umar wanted to beat him. But one of his close advisors, one of the reciters of the Quran, Al-Hur ibn Qais, said to Umar ibn al-Khattab, overlook his faults. Because Allah Jalla wa'ala says, خُذِ الْعَفْوَ وَأْمُرْ بِالْعُرْفِ وَأَعْرِضْ عَنِ الْجَاهِلِينَ And this man is from the Jahileen. With this narration of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, there is another wording in which the narrator says that I entered upon Abu Musa al-Ash'ari whilst he was eating chicken. And Abu Musa al-Ash'ari narrated this whole hadith to me. So that's just an interesting point to pick up on. He was eating chicken. It was not that popular amongst the Sahaba to eat chicken. In fact, it's been narrated that the Sahaba would rather eat the meat of the desert lizard than chicken. But in any case, here we do have a textual evidence that the Sahaba would eat chicken. And indeed, chicken is halal to be eaten if it is slaughtered properly. In the chapter, we have another narration from Adi ibn Hatim radiallahu anhu. A man came to him asking him to give charity. Adi says that I only have a chainmail and my helmet, so I will write to my family that they should give that to you. But the one who was seeking the charity was not content with this charity. And so Adi became angry and he took an oath. Wallahi, I will not give you anything. And then after that, the one who was asking Adi, he became content with what Adi is giving him, meaning to say the chainmail and the helmet. To which Adi says, Behold, if it wasn't for the fact that I heard the Prophet say that whoever takes an oath and then sees something which is more righteous than his oath, then let him do that which is more righteous. And so upon that then, Adi broke the oath and did give the questioner what he wanted, the chainmail and the helmet. We find from this narration that if you give somebody who is begging you, and he's not content, then you can actually punish him. That is to say, give him a ta'zir by taking an oath that I will not give you anything. And as the old English saying goes, beggars cannot be choosers. So how is this man not being content when he's been given? And Adi did not even have to give him in the first place. So this narration of Adi ibn Hatim tells us that a ta'zir can be given to the one who begs you, but is not content with whatever you are giving him because you did not have to give him in the first place. And it ought to be known that Adi ibn Hatim was a companion who was known for his generosity. And with regards to the hadith of Samurai ibn Jundub, we find that the Prophet has forbidden to seek positions of authority. Because the one who seeks position of authority wants might and power and authority. And he is doing it for his own self. His intentions are not pure. And he wants to have tahakkum where he wants it his way where his opinion is what matters. So the Prophet said, فَإِنَّكَ إِنْ أُعْطِيتَهَا عَنْ مَسْأَلَةٍ وَكِلْتَ إِلَيْهَا If you ask for it, and you are given it, you will be left to its own devices, meaning Allah will not aid you and give you barakah. But if you are given it without asking for it, then Allah will give you barakah. And this is what happens in these democracies. The candidates, they go out begging people to vote for them. They are asking for these positions of authority. As for asking about the dini positions, such as to be an imam of a masjid, then we know from the Sunan authentically that Uthman ibn Abi al-As asked the Prophet to make him the imam of his community. And the Prophet says, Anta imamuhum faqtadi bi adafihim. You are the imam, so follow the weakest of them, meaning give them due consideration. وَلَا تَتَّخِذْ مُؤَذِّنًا يَأْخُذُ عَلَىٰ أَذَانِهِ أَجْرًا Do not take a mu'addin who demands payment for his avan. However, when it comes to political 
authority, then we say the asal is that you do not ask for it. The Prophet ﷺ authentically said, Inna la nuwalli hadha al-amr man sa'ala. We do not appoint in charge of this matter, meaning the political matter, the one who asks for it. However, the ulama say there is an exception to this rule, where if you find that everyone who is being appointed for this political role of power, of authority, is not fitting for it, and you're the only one fitting for it, then you can ask for it. And they take their evidence from what Yusuf Islam did. He asked the king, إِجْعَلْنِي عَلَىٰ خَزَائِنِ الْأَرْضِ إِنِّي حَفِيظٌ عَلِيمٌ Make me in charge of the treasury of the land. I am knowledgeable and the one who is able to guard the wealth. And even in this case of Yusuf السلام, it is not the ultimate political position. It is like being a minister of sorts. Okay, let us move to the next chapter. The oath is considered on the intention of the one who asks you to take an oath. From Abu Huraira, the Prophet said, يَمِينُكَ عَلَى مَا يُصَدِّقُكَ عَلَيْهِ صَاحِبُكَ Your oath is to be considered on the basis of the intention of the one who asks you to take an oath, meaning your companion. Generally speaking, when a person takes an oath, there are four stages to look at when we want to know what this person intended by the oath. The first stage is the intention of the one taking the oath. The second is the reason for which the person has taken an oath. Thirdly is the urf or the customs of the people. And fourthly, the language. So let's go through these then. Firstly, we said the intention of the one who takes an oath. For example, he says, Wallahi, I will only sleep on my firash. Firash normally in the Arabic means your bed. But then he goes on and sleeps on the ground, so on the plain earth. Somebody tells him, you have broken your oath. Is there a kafar upon him? Well, if by firash he intended the earth, which you're allowed to do, because Allah says, الَّذِي جَعَلَ لَكُمُ الْأَرْضَ فِرَاشًا He has made the earth as a firash for you. Then sleeping on the earth, therefore, would break the oath, because he has slept on the firash, if that's what he intended. And the Arabic language allows this intention. Whereas on the other hand, if he says, Wallahi, I will eat khubz. Khubz in the language means bread. But then he takes a bar of chocolate and eats it. Has he broken the oath? No, he hasn't. If he says, but I intended by bread a bar of chocolate, we say, no, this intention of yours is invalid because the language does not allow this intention. So notice the two examples then, contrast them. The intention is what we look at as long as the language allows it. The next we have the suburb. That is to say, why has he taken this oath? For example, he says, Wallahi, I will not speak to Zayd. But then he goes on and speaks to Zayd. Has he broken the oath? Well, if we look at the suburb, the reason why he took this oath is because he felt that Zayd was calling to a bid'ah. So he wanted to abandon Zayd for this reason. But then it becomes known to him that Zayd was not calling to a bid'ah. It was all just hearsay. So he then speaks to Zayd because there's no reason to abandon him. We say in a case like this, you have not broken the oath because the suburb or the cause for your taking the oath proved to be invalid or untrue. And thirdly, we look at the urf, the customs of the people, because words can have certain meanings and connotations according to the custom. So if a person says, Wallahi, I will sacrifice for my guest a shah. Shah in the language means a sheep. If he now sacrifices goat, then has he broken the oath? According to the customs of the people, yes he has, because the word shatun does not include the goat, even though it does include it linguistically. And the fourth stage is, we look at the language. If he says, Wallahi, I will not perform the salah. And then he goes and prays the next prayer, let's say Salat al-Dhuhr. Is there a kafara upon him? We would say, yes, there's a kafara upon you, is there not? On the opinion that there is a kafara for a haram oath. We'll go by that opinion. He says, no, there is no kafar upon me because salah in the Arabic language means dua. And I did not merely make a dua. I actually prayed the official salah because that's the language of the Arab. Salah means dua. Well, this could be the case for a non-Muslim. However, if a Muslim was to make this oath, then we would take his words not on the lexical meaning, but on the shari meaning. That is, if a Muslim makes this oath. Okay, so these are the four stages. Now, what this hadith talks about is something a little bit different. This hadith is talking in the context of a court case where you are 
required to take an oath. Your oath will be taken on the intention of the one who has demanded you to take the oath, so that you are unable to play games or, if you like, intention games and to equivocate. يمينك على ما يصدقك عليه صاحبك And he said اليمين على نية المستحلف The oath is upon the intention of the one who demands you that you take the oath. For example, let us suppose you owe somebody a thousand pounds. Then after that, you purchase a computer from him for let's say 500 pounds. But of course that thousand pounds is still pending which you owed him from before when he takes you to court and he demands that you take an oath and you tell the judge Wallahi, I paid him what he demanded. And your intention is that you paid him the £500 for the computer you bought. Your intention is not the £1,000 which he's talking about. However, this intention will not save you. Because as the hadith says, the oath is upon the intention of the one who demands the oath from you. So it is not upon your intention. So if you made this oath, we would take it to mean that you have paid him the £1,000 which is what we are talking about. We are not talking about the 500 pounds you gave him for the computer. Let's take a few more points of benefit. If you were to take an oath by other than Allah Jalla wa'ala, or his attributes, then the oath would not be in effect. So it's as if you did not take an oath. So if you were to break this quote-unquote oath, there would be no kafara on you. Also, taking an oath by a lat or any other false god does not necessarily mean that you're a kafir because Many of the people during the time of the Prophet would take an oath by these false gods. And it is entirely possible that a Muslim has this habit of taking an oath by the false gods, just like they had a habit of taking an oath by their fathers. That does not mean that they deem a lat to be a true god, of course. However, there is still a kafara for such an oath, even if you do not believe that a lat is a true deity. And the reason for this kafara is to completely wipe away from your mind this idea of venerating a lat or any other deity. As for if somebody takes an oath truly believing a lat or any other deity to be an actual deity worthy of worship, then this is major kufr. Now as for the question of whose intention is the oath on, then if you are asked to take an oath by an oppressor and you use equivocation, then the oath is upon your intention if you are being oppressed that is, to ward off a harm from an oppressor, then the rule is opposite to what we hear in the hadith of the chapter. And the evidence of this is the authentic narration in Sunan Abi Dawood where Suwayd ibn Hamdala was traveling with Wa'il ibn Hujar to meet the Prophet and they were met with some mushrikeen, the enemies, who wanted to kill Wa'il ibn Hujar. And Suwayd told them, he is my brother. And because of that, they let him go. Of course, this was a lie, he is not a brother. But when they told the Prophet about this incident, the Prophet acknowledged this, saying, Sadaqta al-Muslim akhul Muslim. You spoke the truth. A Muslim is the brother of a Muslim. So that is to say, brothers in faith, not brothers through lineage. As for other than the oppressor, then your oath is on the intention of the one asking you to take the oath regardless of whether this is a court case or even outside of a court, such as a friend asking you to take an oath because maybe he does not believe what you are saying. It will be on the intention of the one who asks you. So you're not allowed to play any intention games or how they say double entendre, that is to say double speak or equivocation. So if someone asks you to take an oath and he has the right to ask you to take an oath, then it's upon his intention. As for if he does not have the right to ask you to take an oath, such as an oppressor, then it is on your intention. Let's take a look at the next chapter, saying insha'Allah in your oath. Abu Huraira reports that Suleiman had 70 wives. He says, I will have intercourse with all of my wives tonight and each of them will give birth to a child who will fight in the way of Allah. It was said to him, say insha'Allah, but he did not say so and he forgot. And none of his wives gave birth to a child except one who gave birth to a premature child. She only gave birth to half a child because it was prematurely born. To this the Prophet said, لَوْ قَالَ إِن شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَمْ يَحْنَثْ وَكَانَ دَرَكًا لَهُ فِي حَاجَتِهِ If only he had said, Allah, he would not have broken the oath and his desire would have materialized. Saying Allah in your oaths is recommended. Why? Because firstly it will help you realize your oath, meaning materialize it. 
And secondly, even if you fail to perform what you took an oath for, you will not have to offer a kafara. However, the ulama say that when you make an istithna, which is to say, inshallah, or just make any exception to the case, then there are conditions. So from the conditions which they put forward is that the one who is going to make an exception needs to intend this exception as he's giving the speech. So if he is to say something like, every one of you will receive a prize except Zaid, then he had to have intended this exception as he delivered the statement. But of course, as you see from the hadith here, Sulaiman was told by either someone or an angel to say insha'Allah only after he made his statement about going to his wives. So Sulaiman did not intend to say insha'Allah, rather he was told to say insha'Allah. And if he had said insha'Allah, this would have sufficed him. So we find from the narration that this condition which they put forward is not valid. We also have the hadith of the idhkhir, which is a type of plant where the Prophet said that the plants of the haram are not to be plucked out. And Al-Abbas said, but what about Al-Idhkhir? Because the people need it for their graves and their homes. Then the Prophet said, Illa Al-Idhkhir. Yes, except the Idhkhir plant. So again, the Prophet made an exception without having intended it at the beginning of his statement or speech. They also give a second condition. They say that the exception must be linked to the main body of your sentence. So it must be continuous. It must not be two different speeches which you give. And we say yes, we agree to this condition as long as you're speaking about the same topic. And the evidence is just like what we quoted where the Prophet says that the thorns of the haram should not be plucked out and the grass or the plants should not be torn away. And then Al-Abbas said, Illa al-idhkhir, because people need it for their graves and their homes. And the qain, the blacksmiths, also need this plant for their work. And so the Prophet made that exception. So the point is, he was talking all about the same topic when he made the exception. And it was not two different speeches that the Prophet was giving. Likewise, if there is a gap in the speech, for example, you have to sneeze or some other short gap, then that does not harm either. And in saying insha'Allah, you could use various other words which have the same meaning. So insha'Allah, illa in yasha'Allah, or you could say bi mashi'atillah, we could say bi iradatillah, we could say bi ithnillah, we could say idha aradallah. All of these have generally the same meaning, and they all count as exception making. They also give the condition that if you're going to make an exception, then that which is made an exception from should be more than the exception. So you cannot say, I will give you £10 except £7. But you could say, I will give you £10 except £3. Because the exception is the minority. And they reason this out by saying that to say, I will give you £10 except £7 is not eloquent speech. However, we would disagree with this condition. We would say, even if it is not eloquent speech, still it is grammatically sound. And if it is grammatically sound, then that is what matters, not necessarily the eloquence. Okay, so we can pick up some more benefit from this hadith. The strength of Sulaiman in that he had 60 wives. The numbers vary. Some narrations say 60, some say 70, some say 100, and some say 99, and so on. The numbers vary. That does not harm the narration. The point is he had many wives. We do not need to know exactly how many they were. Why? Because it does not affect the ruling at all. Now, who can manage to have 60 wives? This requires physical strength, spiritual strength, emotional strength, and mental strength. You have to be strong in every single aspect. Most people cannot even handle one wife, as we find from so many failed marriages. In fact, failed marriages are becoming the norm. So how about 60 wives? This is from the fadl or the grace of Allah Jalla wa'ala upon Sulaiman alayhi salam. Let's take a look at the next chapter about persisting in an oath which causes trouble to the family from that which is not haram. From Hammam ibn Munabbih that Abu Huraira reported to them that the Prophet والسلام, said Wallahi la'in yalajja ahadukum biyaminihi fi ahlihi aathamu lahu indallahi min an yu'tiya kaffaratahu allati faradallah By Allah, it is more sinful with Allah that one of you persists in an oath regarding his family than just to pay off the kafara for that oath which Allah has ordained on him. 
So this hadith is about a person taking an oath to do something which will cause some trouble and aggravation to his family. It is better for him just to break the oath and relieve his family from any pain and suffering which he may be inflicting on them due to his oath and simply offer the kafara. So if a man says to his children, Wallahi, I will not play with you, this could cause some harm or perhaps upset the children if their father is not spending time playing with them. So rather than saying, oh, well, I've made the oath, so I must keep it now, rather than saying that and upsetting the children, it is better to break the oath, play with your children and offer the kafara for breaking the oath. This is better. Let's move to the next chapter about what a kafir embracing Islam should do pertaining to a vow which he made. We'll take this hadith from Ibn Umar. He says that Umar, who was his father, said to the Prophet, During the days of Jahiliyyah, I took a vow to spend a night in the Masjid al-Haram, making it a tikaf. And the Prophet told him, فَأَوْفِي بِنَذْرِكْ So fulfill your vow. So we take from the narration that if a person is a kafir and he takes a vow to do something and then he embraces Islam, then that vow is still in effect. And that's clearly taken from the narration. However, we find that he takes an oath to make a tikaf of one night in the Masjid al-Haram. And this would have been outside Ramadan. And at night time, nobody is fasting. So is it legislated to make your atikaf outside Ramadan? The answer is no, it is not legislated. But it is permissible in that it is not a bid'ah. And the evidence is this hadith. The Prophet only ever made your atikaf seeking Laylatul Qadr except for one year in which he saw his wives making your atikaf and he did not approve of this. So he did not make your atikaf and he made up for it during the first 10 days of Shawwal. That was the only exception. Otherwise, the whole point of i'tikaf is to seek Laylatul Qadr. And so therefore it is only legislated to make the i'tikaf during the last 10 nights of Ramadan. However, we say that if you make a vow to make your i'tikaf during one night or more outside Ramadan, then you must fulfill this. However, we do not encourage people to make your i'tikaf outside Ramadan. It is not legislated. And it is not the sunnah. And this situation is similar to the hadith where one companion during a battle expedition would lead the prayer and always end his recitation with Qul Allahu Ahad. And the Prophet got to know about this because the companions thought it to be strange. And the Prophet approved of it when he was told that the reason why he does it is because it is the sifat rahman It is the description of Ar-Rahman and I love to recite it. And the Prophet says that Allah loves this man. So clearly the Prophet approved of it, but we say that such a thing is permissible. It is not, however, legislated. In that, the best we can say it is not a bid'ah, but we cannot go ahead and now say it is recommended and legislated. It is a similar thing with Bilal radiallahu an making two rakat of salah after he does wudu. The Prophet approved of such an action. However, the Prophet himself did not verbally order it to be done, neither did the Prophet himself do it. Yes, it is true that there is such a thing as performing two rakat after you make your wudu, but that is not taken from the narration of Bilal. Note the difference. That is taken from the narration of Uthman an, where he performed the wudu, and he said that I saw the Prophet perform wudu like this, and I heard the Prophet saying, Man Whoever makes wudu like this of mine, and then he prays two rakat afterwards, then his sins will be forgiven. That is where we take the evidence for making two rakat of the nafila salah after the wudu. It is from the verbal recommendation of the Prophet, not from the action of Bilal. So note this crucial difference. So back to the atikaf. If someone were to say that every time you enter the masjid, have your niyyah for atikaf, we say this is a bid'ah. Some narrations tell us that Omar says he made a vow to spend a day during the atikaf. And some narrations use the word layla, night. So the way we combine it is to say that he meant a day, because a day includes the light hours and the dark hours. So what he intended was a day with its night. So in other words, 24 hours by our reckoning. Let's take the next chapter about the one 
who slaps his servant from Ibn Umar that the Prophet said Man latama mamlukahu aw darabahu fakaffaratuhu ay yu'tiqah Whoever slaps his servant or beats him then the expiation for this is that he should free the servant In another narration he says Man daraba ghulaman lahu haddan lam ya'tihi aw latamahu فَإِنَّ كَفَّارَتَهُ أَنْ يُعْتِقَهُ Whoever beats his servant for something he is not worthy to be beaten for or he slaps the servant then its expiation is that the master needs to free the servant. However, we say just as a father is allowed to give his children a disciplinary hitting so he can do that to his servant as well and it is not obligatory to free the servant. Most scholars say that this hadith مَنْ لَطَمَ مَمْلُوكَهُ أَوْ ضَرَبَهُ فَكَفَّارَتُهُ أَنْ يُعْتِقَهُ is to be taken as a recommendation, not an obligation. And even that is on the condition that their servant be a mu'min, as in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, اَعْتِقْهَا فَإِنَّهَا مُؤْمِنَةً Free her, for she is a mu'mina, when the Prophet asked her, where is Allah? And she said, in the highness. And that is part of a longer narration. This hadith, and those similar to it, inform us of the rights of the servant. And this slavery is not like the black slavery which people are familiar with. Islam did not abolish this servitude of people as they were seen as part of people's wealth, meaning the servants were. But it did encourage freeing the servant, and that is the believing servant. Let's take this other narration in the chapter from Suwayd ibn Muqarrin. He said that we had a servant girl and one member of our family became enraged with her and slapped her on the face. Whereupon Suwayd said, أَمَا عَلِمْتَ أَنَّ الصُّورَةَ muharrama? Did you not know that the surah is haram, meaning to say the face is haram to be hit because the member slapped the servant girl on her face. And Suwayd went on to explain to this man, you see, during the time of the Prophet, I was the seventh one amongst my brothers and we only had one servant. One of us got enraged and slapped him and the Prophet ordered us to free him. So in this narration there's an interesting point. Did you not know that the surah is haram? He's talking about the face. It is haram to hit the face. You can give a disciplinary hitting. There's no doubt about that. But never to the face. The Prophet ﷺ said, خلق الله آدم على سورة الرحمن Allah created Adam on the image of the Rahman. So it is not permissible to deface another person. And to target the face is the worst type of defacing someone. It is not even allowed to deface the face of animals. As in Sahih Muslim, a donkey passed by the Prophet whose face had been marked, cauterized with fire. And the Prophet said, Allahu man wasama. Allah curses the one who branded this donkey's face. So if it is haram to brand an animal's face, and that such a person is cursed, then how much more haram is it to violate a human face? Somebody might say, if Allah created Adam on the Surah of Ar-Rahman, then does that mean that humans look like Allah then? The answer is no, because there is none like unto Allah Jalla wa'ala. وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٍ And in the Sahih, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ أَوَّلَ زُمْرَةٍ تَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةِ عَلَى سُورَةِ الْقَمَرِ لَيْلَةَ الْبَدَرِ the first group of people to enter Jannah will be upon the surah of the moon on the night of the full moon. That does not mean that these humans will look like a full moon. Of course not. But they will be bright just like the full moon is bright on the night of the full moon. It lights up the night sky. So there is a link between the full moon and the first group of people entering Jannah. But that does not mean that the first group of people entering Jannah will look exactly like the full moon. Some others have interpreted the hadith ala surat al-Rahman, meaning the surah, the image which the Rahman has created, that is, created for Adam and henceforth his progeny. As in we say, the she-camel of Allah, that is, the she-camel which Allah has created. We say, yes, this is a possible interpretation. However, even if we go by the other interpretation, the first one, which is a bit more apparent, there is still no problems with aqidah as long as we know that there is nothing like unto Allah Jalla wa'ala. Let's take this next hadith also in the same chapter from Abu Mas'ud al-Ansari. He says, when I was beating my servant, 
I heard a voice behind me saying, "Ilam Aba Masud, no, O Abu Masud, meaning to say you should know. Lallahu Akadaru Aleka Minka Alehi. Allah has more power over you than you have over him. He said, I looked behind and there was the Messenger of Allah. And he said, Ya Rasulullah huwa hurrun li wajhillah. O Messenger of Allah, he is free seeking the face of Allah. The Prophet told him, Ama law lam taf'al la lafahatka nar o lamasatka nar. The Prophet replied to that by saying, Behold, if you did not set him free, the fire would have scorched you or the fire would have touched you. This is a powerful narration. It teaches us that if you have authority over some people, then you need to know that Allah Jalla has yet greater authority over you. So if you ever abuse your authority, then know there is someone above you who will treat you with justice and give you exactly what you deserve. So fear Allah Jalla with regards to the people you have authority over. And there is a strong link between this and the ayat of Surah An-Nisa where Allah Jalla says, وَاللَّاتِي تَخَافُونَ نُشُوزَهُنَّ فَعِذُوهُنَّ وَهْجُرُوهُنَّ فِي الْمَضَاجِعِ وَاضْرِبُوهُنْ فَإِنْ أَطَعْنَكُمْ فَلَا تَبَهُوا عَلَيْهِنَّ سَبِيلًا إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلِيًّا كَبِيرًا And those wives who are disobedient and recalcitrant then admonish them. After that, separate their bedding. And after that, hit them. Meaning not on the face, but a disciplinary hit. Not leaving any bruises or marks and not on the face. And if they obey you, then do not seek any other means of punishment against them. Notice how he ends the ayah. Verily, Allah was ever the high, the great. So he is saying that you have authority over certain people. Let's say your wife and your children. So you have some highness over them. But Allah is the Aliyan Kabira, the high, the great. So he is even higher than you are and has more authority over you than you have over your subjects or family. And then you do not know how affairs could change. You yourself could become a servant who are then abused. And this would be poetic justice, of course. So fear Allah Jalla wa'ala. In some narrations, it says that Abu Mas'ud was beating the servant so much with a whip that he did not even understand the voice behind him. So when you are so enraged, you lose your senses. You become like a drunk person. We take from the narration of Abu Mas'ud to enjoy the good and forbid the evil just as the Prophet ﷺ did here. Never let the fear of the people prevent you from enjoying the good and forbidding the evil. As for the Prophet saying, when this person freed his servant, behold, if you did not do it, the fire would have scorched you or the fire would have touched you. It indicates to us that it would have been wajib for the man to free this servant. Otherwise, the fire would have touched him. So one may argue that it is wajib to free the servant if you are beating them without due right. But the mainstream opinion is that it is a recommendation to free them as long as they are mu'min. Would be hitting the face in any circumstances, striking more than 10 strikes because we have evidence for that. And this is if the servant disobeys you, not disobeys Allah Jalla wa'ala. And also not hitting him so as to bruise him or bleed him. Rather it is a disciplinary hitting. And also the reason for the hitting must be right and proper. If he, for example, accidentally spills a drink, this is not justification for hitting him. Whereas if he is guilty of gross negligence, then that is justification for a disciplinary hitting. Let's take a few more points of benefit. We find that even prophets can forget to do that which is proper. Just like Sulaiman forgot to say insha'Allah. And that is only because they are humans it does not detract from their status. Also notice how the Prophet said, لَوْ قَالَ إِنْشَاءَ اللَّهِ لَمْ يَحْنَثْ وَكَانَ دَرَكًا لَهُ فِي حَاجَتِهِ If only he had said إِنْشَاءَ Allah. To use the words if only is not permitted if it is done by way of regret over what happened in the past because that is opposing the other. However, if you say if only just by way of information then that is permissible just as the Prophet did here. So when the Prophet says, if only, the Prophet does not regret what Sulaiman Salam did. He is just giving us what would have happened. So it is an information. Also, it's worth pointing out that in another hadith, which is authentic, the Prophet said, Man halafa faqala insha'Allah lam yahnath. So if you say insha'Allah when taking your oath, and if you do not do what you set out to do, 
then you do not need to offer a kafara. Otherwise, you would need to offer a kafara for breaking the oath. And note that this insha'Allah is when you hinge this event on the will of Allah Jalla wa'ala. Otherwise, it is possible to say insha'Allah as a tabarruk, seeking a blessing with the name of Allah Jalla wa'ala. Now, if that is your intention and you do not fulfill your oath, then you do have to offer the kafara because you did not hinge the event on the will of Allah. Rather, you use the words insha'Allah as a tabarruk or seeking a blessing. And that is not the same. So not the difference then. It depends on your intention. Why are you saying insha'Allah? What do you intend by it? Okay, let's take some review questions. So question number one. What is a yameen ghamus? Question number two. What are the four stages of interpreting the oath? Question number three. What is the expiation for hitting your servant unjustifiably and give the evidence?